you're brand new to the channel, be sure to hit that subscribe button. Also be sure to hit that like button to support the channel. Let's begin. Okay, so continuing with part three of Sins of the Future, it looks like this will be the final part of this story breakdown. We are at the home stretch to the end, people. And there's a whole lot to unpack here. And I will try my damn hardest to break all of this down in the simplest way possible. But then again, we're dealing with the Time Force Power Rangers here. Nothing is simple. So I think a good place to start is where we left off last time. Just for a small recap, Jen and Nadira are about to break into the Time Force HQ to get access to any data about the Black Time Force Ranger. And we get this monologue from the Black Time Force Ranger who basically says that she holds Jen responsible for Alex Drake's death. Now, moving on. The next couple of panels consist of Jen and Nadira breaking into the Time Force HQ, and the moment Jen enters, she's confronted with what looks like Rancic at his most powerful. But it is here that Nadira basically explains to her that what she is seeing isn't exactly real. These are all of Jen's memories that she is being confronted with from her future, the future she knew before she met Wes and Eric. And it is here that she sees these flashes of her life, particularly from when she was training in the academy to become a Time Force officer. And the lines are blurred between reality and what's fake. And this is pretty much going to set the tone for everything that we're about to discuss here. The only thing I'll tell you all is this. Pay attention. That's all I'll say. So after Jen and Nadira basically fight their way through the headquarters, trying to find out exactly how this Black Ranger is traveling through the time stream without a ship, since that's the only known way to time travel at all, and this is when Jen is confronted once again by the Black Time Force Ranger, and the two get into a rather ugly confrontation, traveling through multiple time streams, all the while the Black Ranger is blaming Jen for Alex Drake being murdered. And of course, Jen is confused because in her eyes, the only one responsible for Alex's death was Rancic. It was all on him. But this Black Ranger is so convinced that it was all Jen's fault, telling her, you thought you could mess with the past by pursuing a relationship with Alex's ancestor, Wes Collins, not thinking about the consequences. So in turn, this is your fault. And to a point, the scary thing is, this ranger is right to a certain degree because Jen and Wes's love broke every single rule in the book about time travel. We've gone over this twice before, but the reason why I keep bringing it up is because Jen and Wes's love is the biggest sin anyone can ever commit. As pure as it might be, the issue is, Jen is in love with the ancestor of her dead fiancé. Her heart is torn between Alex and Wes. And in turn, Wes had knowledge of the future, something that shouldn't have happened. I mean, haven't we learned anything from Eobarthon from The Flash? Didn't he speak about the consequences of time travel in Injustice 2? Does anyone remember? Long way from the future to hurt you, Barry. But this timeline, it's all wrong. So go back to your own time, Reverse Flash. <laughs> Think I haven't tried? Your regime buddies killed one of my ancestors. Now I'm trapped in a paradox. I can never go home. At least I can hurt you! Yeah, take a lesson from the Flash comics. Never mess with time itself. Barry Allen has screwed up enough timelines in his tenure. And I have no problem saying that, even though he's my personal favorite Flash. Jen, I'm sorry to break it to you, but you did screw up. You and Wes. Not that she wasn't aware of that already, don't worry. I'm not gonna beat the dead horse anymore. I think I've scolded her and Wes enough here. Anyway, back to the action. So the battle between Jen and this Black Time Force Ranger reaches its peak when Jen removes this Ranger's helmet, and the person that's revealed underneath leaves Jen in complete shock. 
because this girl is Syra Drake, Alex Drake's little sister. And it is here that we get a flashback of Syra and Alex, with Alex essentially training her for the day that she'll eventually become part of the Power Rangers. And from these panels, we can see that Alex and Syra had a very close relationship, and they loved each other very much. And Alex was protective of his little sister and vice versa. And so when Syra witnessed Alex get murdered by Rancic, it messed her up big time, and she feels that Jen and all the other rangers let Alex just die, but Jen allowing it to happen hurt 10 times more, because Jen was going to be her sister-in-law. And ever since then, Syrah has gone back in time, trying so many times to stop her brother's murder, and each time, she just sees Alex die again and again, and at one point she even saw him die at Jen's hands. But this is the moment where Jen comes up with a peace offering, and she offers to help Syra figure out why all these timelines are so screwed up. And Syra realizes, wait, so if it wasn't you who allowed Alex to die, then who did? And this is where Jen examines Syra's chronomorpher, and she remembers what Captain Logan said about hyperforce training, how in that diagram there was the color black. And when Jen and Nadira get a good look at it, they see a signature inside the Morpher. The signature of Dr. Louis Ferrix. Now, Dr. Ferrix is quite important. And for those of you who haven't watched all of Time Force, I know I haven't. I'm guilty as charged. I'm going to do my very best to explain who Dr. Ferrix is based off what little understanding I do have. Thank God for Wikipedia pages. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, Dr. Ferrix was a man who at one point desired to try and cure Rancic of this poison that was slowly killing him. He was willing to help save Rancic's life despite him being a mutant, but Rancic, by that point, he was completely jaded by anyone who was human, thinking them all to be the same, and as a result, he heavily wounded Dr. Ferrix and left him for death, and as a result, Ferrix was left with this burning hatred of, of um, Rancic, and he transferred his consciousness into this villainous robot, Frax, pretending to side with Rancic and his army of mutants during the war while secretly desiring to tear apart Rancic. He was basically what Finster was to Rita Repulsa, a drone who created every single monster the rangers had to fight while being underappreciated for his brilliance and developing a ton of resentment. So the fact that his human form Dr. Ferrix created the black chronomorpher, this is important because the next panel we see, we're seeing a conversation between Dr. Ferrix and Captain Logan that occurred at one point. Dr. Ferrix created transwarp augmented morphers, which from what I can configure are more sophisticated versions of the chronomorphers the Time Force Rangers use based off what he is saying here. Now, this is important because the way Dr. Ferrix is talking here, um, he's talking about creating a device allowing for people to time travel without the specialty ships that the Time Force Rangers use, claiming it can prevent accidents and tragedies before they occur. And while this might seem um, noble, Captain Logan tells him that this could lead to a chronal genocide. And from the looks of it, this was around a time where Dr. Ferrix was building the uh, Frax robot. So Jen goes on to saying that Ferrix allegedly destroyed these transwarp chronomorphers. But the fact that Syrah has one, this just proves he BS'd Captain Logan. He didn't actually destroy them. And this is when Captain Logan shows up, and him showing up provides some further explanation about the inconsistencies that are occurring within the timeline. Logan basically explains to Syrah that she went back in time and killed her brother's ancestor, but he, it doesn't seem that he's entirely framing her as guilty here, at least from what I'm able to gather, mostly because he points out that what Syra had been seeing, Jen being responsible for killing Alex, there's a rather huge anomaly with the timeline itself. And Syra says every time she witnesses Alex's death in these timelines, something changes dramatically, which further confuses her. So Nadira ends up patching through to her father 
and asks Rancic, who is now the new director, to break protocol. And the hilarious thing is, he's happy to do it. Except when Nadira brings up the fact that they need information on Frax's lab, that's when Rancic changes his tune. And he's not willing to read any data about the individual who betrayed him. And Jen brings up to him that they need information particularly on this location that Syrah had taken her to when they were battling through the time stream, a black site as they call it here. But Rancic tells them it's referred to as Outpost 1 and it's described by Rancic that this was the very place that allowed for Time Force to even be made possible because of its connection to the Morphin Grid. It's a power source outside the means of the conventional, and it's the castle between space and time itself. So Jen, Syrah, and Nadira board Jen's ship, and they make their way towards Outpost 1. And in order to get there, they need to jam their way through the time stream, and they just crash inside and it is here that the three women battle what look like enhanced versions of the cyclobots and the door to outpost one just opens for them the first sign of something being an ominous here this is where nadira jen and syra see these flashes of dr ferrix working on something and it explains that ferrix was conducting experiments on the cyclobots and he says that after many trials and errors he's begun to see the effects of time travel on the normal human mind he tried to genetically alter his human volunteers to withstand the effects of time travel but it unfortunately made them extremely weak traveling back so many years which you know was substantial enough so what he tried doing next was experimenting on the Cyclobots' exterior, and inside it, there's a young man from Eltar. Eltar, Zordon's home planet, the man who started it all on Earth. And this is when you know shit is getting real, because it's revealed that the Morphin Grid is reacting to the Transwarp Drive, and he asks this young man, whom he nicknames as Z, if everything is alright, and wait, Z as in Zordon? This is another one of those major WTF moments. It makes you wonder, was Zordon there at the time? Because think about it, a young man nicknamed Z and he comes from Eltar? Is there any other possibility? And Nadira says that this was what started it all with the chronal skips. Farrix was altering the Morphin Grid. And I thought Grace Sterling does some pretty screwed up shit in the main comics right now. But this is another level. And then, when they go and access Dr. Ferrix's diaries, it's revealed that Ferrix created Venomark, the mutagen poison that was designed to kill mutants like Rancic and Nadira. The same poison Ferrix claimed he was creating a cure for. And Nadira does a good job at explaining this for the audience who didn't watch all of Time Force. I'm actually glad that they put this in here, because like us, Syra is out of the loop on a lot of what's occurring here. So after Nadira explains all this, this builds up into a confrontation between this robotic clone of Frax known as Frix, Jen, Syra, and Nadira in Outpost 1's mainframe. And Frix explains here that when Dr. Ferrix transferred his consciousness into Frax, he created a double to act as backup in case Frax didn't work out. And Frix here, he explains that by tapping into the Morphin Grid and traveling through the time stream, that he is using this as an opportunity to go back and fix all of Farrick's mistakes. And in turn, he is planning on killing every single mutant in the future to prevent them from ever existing. And it's pretty clear why Farrick left Frix behind. Frix is by far the most unstable thing to ever exist, if he sees this as saving everyone. And even Syra points out that what he plans on doing is committing a mass genocide. She points out that these mutants, they're people. They can be cured of the Venomark virus. That there's a chance their lives could be saved. And when Syra goes to fight him, Frix ends up tapping into the time stream through the Morphin Grid, and he decides to send her off where there are no humans. The prehistoric era. And so Jen ends up morphing, and this is the moment that is beyond badass for her. She says that by accepting the past, 
you're preserving it and you're using that as a means to move forward. That you cannot just alter the timelines and expect that everything that went wrong will be fixed entirely. And she's completely right here in what she's saying. And it is after she defeats Frix that she realizes everything that's been occurring this whole time has been a paradox. And that's when Jen sees the Black Chrono Morpher and she realizes, I need to get this back to Syra to prevent this paradox. And I need to go back in time to when she was a child, the year of 3000, before Alex died, before Time Force traveled to the year of 2000. And Jen does exactly that. And when she hands this Morpher to Syra, she tells her to never, ever stop being loving. That even though Alex is going to die at some point in the future, she'll need to confront it and grieve and mourn and tells her, once a ranger, always a ranger. And when Jen makes her way back to Outpost 1, she meets with a much older Syrah who tells her, decades ago we stopped Fricks. I've learned to move on from Alex's death, and now that the mission is over, I'm giving you my morpher. Hide it, ensure that no one else will get their hands on it. And Jen, as a result, crushes the Morpher in her hand. And she goes on to say, no matter what happens, we need to accept the good and the bad that comes with it all. And when Syra walks away, this cuts to sometime later, in the past or the future, whatever you decide to see it as, we see Jen and Wes reunited. I mean, now that things are fixed, Wes is obviously alive now. He's back. He's all right. And he's gotta be. If Wes weren't alive, do you think Jason Fonts could have come back for the 25th anniversary episode with JDF and Kat Sutherland? You just know in this book that even though Wes might have died at one point, there had to be a moment where he'd make a return. And this is that moment where he and Jen have one more dinner date and Jen welcomes him to Outpost 1 and she tells him, I don't know if you remember, but at one point I was supposed to break up with some version of you. And Wes asks her, are we over? And she says, no, they're not. At least not yet. They're together the way it should be. And Jen explains that Outpost 1 can be for anyone who at one point was a Power Ranger. Anyone with that connection to the Morphin Grid can access it. And Wes asks, is this the future or is it the past? And Jen says, no, it's neither. It's right now, the present. Talk about a beautiful, romantic, happy ending right there that I am a total sucker for. And that is it, everyone. That's the conclusion of Sins of the Future. If you enjoyed the video, be sure to leave a comment down below and let me know your thoughts. Also, be sure to check out my social media. Links will be down below in the description per usual. God bless, happy viewing, and have a nice day.